one of the next scenes is that he's seated, um, and you get a sense of the mythological nature of it, he's seated in the landa at Pavarika's um, mango grove under these beautiful trees with his disciples. And Sariputta, who's his second-hand man, his chief disciple in wisdom, looks at him admiringly and says, there could never be a better teacher, a more enlightened one than the blessed one. You know, kind of like that. And the Buddha looks back and says, how do you know? Do you know all the teachers of past eons? Do you know the ones who are yet to come? How could you make a statement like that? Who do you, you know, it's just a little bit inflated to say, okay, I know. And Sariputta, being pretty wise, says, again, he answers with a kind of metaphor. He says, there's a great city with a mighty wall, like a castle, and a single gate, and a wise and skilled gatekeeper who rests at that single gate, and that gate is the reality of the present, is now, which is all we ever have in life is now. And when that gatekeeper tends to the present, to the reality of the present, and sees what's skillful and healthy and what's unskillful and unhealthy, and discovers the possibility of liberation now and now and now, they will be awakened just as you, blessed one, have been awakened, and just as the blessed ones of the past and the future, all the Buddhas, they all rest in the reality of the present. And the Buddha said, hmm, pretty good answer, you know, just so, sorry, Puta. The poet Rumi who writes, um, what is this fuss we make when we will go one by one through that same gate? So here's this kind of the gate also of birth and death that we all share. So he establishes uh, first the sense of a kingdom of justice, where if people honor one another, meet with respect, care for the natural environment, care for the vulnerable. And here again is the same image, which sparks something in the heart. What does it mean to rest in the, at the one gate, at the center of your life, in the eternal present, with care for that which is healthy and wise, and that which is unhealthy, um, to not follow? So setting up this sense that we can live in this way. And then, having set up this sense, the Buddha goes on to teach about how, in fact, all who are awakened rest in mindful awareness, or what I was calling loving awareness. This is the abode of the awakened ones, the abode of the Buddhas. And they then get up and they wander, and they come to the banks of the Ganges River, And they're at the river, and the river is quite high, and there's some boats, and there's someone crossing the river in a great raft made of logs. And the Buddha says, at that point, in the flooded, he said, this raft, what is its value, my friends? Kind of these very simple elementary questions. And they say, to cross over to the Buddha, to cross over. And he says, similarly, the teachings of the Dharma are to cross over from the shore of confusion and fear and contraction and misunderstanding to the shore of liberation of heart. And then he looks up, and this is a very famous moment in these texts, and he said, should one have crossed over in, the, in this fashion, would it then make sex, sense to pick the raft up and carry it around with you on the other side? <laughs> and the followers say, no, you know, they're pretty smart, okay. No, blessed one, no, Buddha, it doesn't make a lot of sense. He said, similarly, all the teachings that have been offered to you, the practices of compassion and forgiveness and mindfulness and the Eightfold Path and the Four Noble Truths and so forth, they are skillful means they are your raft to come to cross from confusion and contraction and fear to freedom. Then should you carry them? No. You should then walk freely without dragging the weight of those teachings and practices, you should make use of them, but not be attached to them in that way. So again, it's a kind of metaphorical teaching, but it sure is one that you know, is useful for humanity, because otherwise we find something that's good, and then pretty soon we want to hold on to it and convert everybody else, and don't realize that it's the means for us to become free, and in and itself is the vehicle for that. It's not the end of the story. So they wander again further in the great forests. 
And here the Buddha says, I'll take some time alone and sits under a tree um, in uh, a very uh, famous grove not so far from Vulture's Peak. And as he sits quietly, he has a visit from Mara. Now Mara in Indian mythology is the name for the god who represents destruction, greed, aggression, hatred, cruelty, all the things that we might say is evil in some fashion or bad or, or suffering. And in the great myth of the Buddha's enlightenment, Mara comes and tempts him under the Bodhi tree with desires and his armies of flaming arrows and all these kinds of things, and the Buddha remains unmoved. So Mara comes back to visit. And turns out Mara comes regularly to visit the Buddha and tries to tempt him again periodically. And the Buddha just looks up generally and says, oh, is that you, Mara, again? I haven't seen you for a while. And then it says Mara looks somewhat chagrined and says, oh, he knows me, he sees me, and he kind of slinks away. <clears throat> Which is a great teaching about the power of attention. Because the unhealthy desires that are addictions or the unhealthy perseveration of thoughts of anxiety or uh, or anger towards somebody that you rerun over and over again. You know those forms of Mara that come to you. When you can see, oh, this is the anxious mind, you know, and this is the um, addictive mind, and this is the, you know, guilty mind, and so forth. When you can name it, it's like, oh, you see me, you see who, this is the judging mind. If you believe your judging mind, you're in trouble, because mostly you know who it judges. Moi? says Miss Piggy. Yes, that's right. It's just aimed at you. Thank you for your opinion. That's the judging. The minute you name Mara, it gets a lot easier because you're seeing what's true with mindfulness. So the Mara appears and says to the Buddha, may the Buddha now take his final leave, his final nirvana. And the Buddha says, I see you, Mara. And Mara says, yes, I've come many times and you told me long ago when I said, you've taught enough that you would not take leave of this earth until you had a strong community of monks and nuns and lay followers until the path of teachings was spread widely. And only then would you leave, well, you have a strong community and the path is spread wisely and it's your time. And uh, Mara says that to him. And the Buddha says, you need not worry. I am turning 80 this year and in not many months I will indeed take my leave. <laughs> 